Before we get into things, today's episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Creepscast listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash mrcreeps. And Audible. Get started with your 30-day free trial by visiting audible.com slash creepscast or text creepscast to 500 at 500. My everyone, I hope you're ready for this week's episode. We have a dazzling collection of the creepiest tales found on the internet. Do you think you can handle them, or are you too scared? I guess we'll see. Let's journey further into Mr. Creep's mind. My grandpa told me a story about his time in Vietnam. Written by... J. Bird, R.S. My grandfather served in the Vietnam War. I was always fascinated about his time in the service, but my mother had instructed me to not ask him about it from a young age. I never did. But he would bring up little bits and pieces now and then, it wasn't often, though. My grandfather was a kind, yet a strict man. My grandma told me that he was a very laid-back and calm man before the war. But afterwards, he became the old, hardened man that I knew growing up. I distinctively remember playing with military toys as a kid. And he just walked in and shook his head, saying, It wasn't like that, kid. What I'm trying to say is that, although I love my grandfather, he can be a cold man sometimes. I don't blame him. I didn't see the horrors that he saw. Time has taken a toll on my grandfather, though, and all his years of smoking have finally caught up with him. For the last few weeks, he's been in a hospital on his deathbed. The cancer has spread from his lungs to the rest of his body. I've been spending a lot of time beside his bed, just keeping him company or watching TV with them. Recently, likely because he knows that his time is coming sooner than later, he has been telling stories. Some have been about his childhood, raising my mother, old school friends, while others, and more importantly, have been about his time in Vietnam. The story started off small, with him first telling me about some of his friends that he had served with. As time went on, though, he opened up more and more. He started telling me about the things that he did and saw. He told me about the napalm attacks in the jungle, how he and his squad were right on the outside of the clear zone when it hit. They had watched the planes drop it, setting ablaze the jungle and, in turn, everyone inside. He said that he heard the screams of those burning alive, gut-wrenching, horrible screams of pure agony. It sounded like hell in our world, he said before stating, I suppose it was. As if these sounds weren't enough, one of the victims came running out of the inferno. Like a ball of fire with arms and legs, my grandfather told me. He said after a few dozen yards, he just fell on the ground screaming. My grandfather and a war friend of his walked over to the burning body to see it struggling to extinguish the flames on the ground. 
My grandfather looked away from my eyes at this part of the story. It was just a kid, he sighed. A kid with flesh melting off his bones. He took a deep breath. We couldn't just leave him there like that. So I took up my weapon and I put him out of his misery. I knew that these stories were causing him distress, bringing back memories that he likely had tried to forget for years. I told him that he didn't have to talk about any of this if he didn't want to, but he insisted, saying, That wasn't even the worst thing that I saw. It was the middle of the day. My grandfather and his squad were walking through the jungle. He said they were doing their usual thing when his sergeant put his hand up for all of them to stop and stay quiet. This would happen sometimes, he said. Sergeant would think that he heard something and we would have to shut up. Saved our lives a few times, I suppose. Other times... He trailed off. They all sat and listened for a minute, when my grandfather noticed something. Nothing in the jungle was making a sound. No wildlife, no bugs. Not even the swaying of leaves in the wind. Nothing. He tightened his grip on his gun as he looked around his eyes darting from treetop to the ground, searching for the enemy. It was then that he noticed something. The jungle was always hot. You were never not sweating your butt off, even if you were just standing there, he said. But then, for that one time, it was cold. Ice cold. In just a second, I could see my breath fog up as it left my mouth. My grandpa turned to see his squad mates all looking around in amazement as well, as they all watched the wisps of their breath fog up in the air. They sat there, frozen in shock at what they were witnessing. When a fellow squad mate right behind him jerked to look around all of a sudden, clearly startled by something he had heard in the jungle. Tharp, the soldier, we were buddies. We had seen a lot of crap together in the war, so I knew he was usually level-headed, even under fire. My grandpa clarified, but we could see from the look on his face that whatever he had heard, it had spooked him real bad. And then, out of nowhere, he called out into the jungle, Jill. Grandpa said he had instantly clapped his hands over Tharp's mouth to shut him up. The soldier struggled against my grandpa to try and break free as the rest of his squad got ready for the inevitable firefight that was sure to come. After Tharp had given up their location by yelling, Wait. I interrupted my grandpa's tale. Was Jill another soldier? Jill was Tharp's girlfriend back home. Grandpa said coldly, even with my hand over his mouth, he kept trying to call for Jill over and over again. I kept whispering to him, Tharp, you gotta calm down. Jill's not here. You're gonna get us all killed. But he just kept struggling. That was when another one called out. This time, calling for his mom. No one was there to stop the other soldier like my grandpa had Tharp. 
allowing the soldier to run straight into the jungle, calling out to his mother. Tharp was fighting to break free, tears now rolling down his eyes as he struggled to break free. My grandpa held his ground though, doing his best to keep the soldier pinned. However, my grandpa was distracted as another soldier ran into the jungle, calling after someone they knew from home. Someone who had no right to be in the jungles of Vietnam. Tharp used the distraction to get out his knife and stab my grandfather in the leg. I screamed as Tharp broke free and ran out into the jungle, calling out for Jill. One by one, the squad broke down and ran into the jungle. All the while, the temperature seemed to be getting colder and colder. The whole time, soldiers were running into the jungle for someone that they had heard calling for them. My grandfather heard nothing, nor did it seemingly any of the other men until they too ran out of the clearing after a loved one. Eventually, there was only my grandpa and one other soldier, back to back, guns drawn, and at the ready as their breath fogged up into the now cold jungle air. After a moment of silence, screams of the rogue squad mates filled the jungle air all around them. Some sounded far away while the others seemed to be coming from right next to them. They sounded even more piercing given the silence that had momentarily fallen upon the area. And then it happened for my grandfather. Your grandma. I heard her voice. It was like she was right next to me, whispering into my left ear. His lip was quivering. I turned to look at her when I saw this thing through the trees. It wasn't close to me like it sounded. No, it was a good 30 feet or so back into the clearing. My grandfather paused, so I asked him, What was it? He let out a laugh. Hell if I know, it sure wasn't Charlie, that's for sure. It looked. He pondered, with how he wanted to describe it before saying, It looked like how radio static sounds. Like I couldn't make out what I was seeing, because my eyes were getting a bad signal. I could tell that it was big though. Real, real big. It looked like a shadow too, he added. I could see that it was ripping one of our guys apart, sending the camel legs of one of my squad mates hurtling into the jungle. I didn't want to see what it did to the top half of the guy. I don't know if the other guys that ran towards that thing had seen it, or had just heard a voice and ran that direction in a panic. But whatever the reason, I didn't go after it. I was mortified. I grabbed the guy behind me and started dragging him back in the general direction of our base. He figured out what I was doing and he screamed at me, said that, he wasn't going to leave his soldiers behind. Grandpa paused and reached over to his nightstand to grab a glass of water with a trembling hand. He took a long drink before continuing. I told him it was a suicide mission, that he hadn't seen the thing in the trees, 
and what it would do to him. But he didn't care. He said, we left no man behind and ran into the trees toward the screams of our friends. I continued my way back to base. It wasn't long until I heard gunshots, then screaming, then nothing. I sat in silence as my mind digested my grandfather's story. So, what happened next? I asked. I made it back to base. I tried telling my superiors what had happened, but they figured I was just some scared kid who had seen his squad massacred in front of him. They weren't wrong about that, but I know it wasn't men or bullets that killed them. I know what I saw. My grandfather passed away about two weeks after he had told me that story. Truth be told, I don't know what to think about his story. I figured that I would share it here, let you make your assumptions. But my grandpa was never delusional, even near the end. And although it sounds impossible, I saw the terror in his eyes as he talked about that thing. There was no way anyone would have been able to be that afraid of something that didn't happen. Hi everyone, I hope you are enjoying today's episode so far. I just wanted to take a minute to talk about one of this episode's sponsors, BetterHelp. Is there something interfering with your happiness or is preventing you from achieving your goals? I know personally, I've been struggling a lot recently with motivation and my overall mental health. Sometimes I just lack the energy to get going in the morning, and I felt like I just need someone to talk to to explain how I'm feeling. And this is where BetterHelp has come in and has been really helpful for me personally. BetterHelp is professional counseling done safely and securely online. Whatever you might be dealing with, BetterHelp provides a broad range of counseling expertise that you might not find through traditional therapy. With BetterHelp, your counselor is available 24-7 via messaging and for scheduled weekly video or phone sessions. This especially has been helpful for me because it lets me skip the awkward waiting room experience that you would get in in-person therapy. I highly recommend checking out BetterHelp. It's really helped me and I think it can do the same for you. Get started today by visiting betterhelp.com slash mrcreeves to get 10% off your first month. That's better, H-E-L-P. And join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Again, this podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and Creepscast listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash mrcreeps. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode. I found a journal from the Cold War. Its contents disturb me. Written by Narsico. Hello, my name isn't important. All you need to know is that I'm an urban explorer, or at least I was one. You see, my friends and I heard about this abandoned lab that was used in the Cold War, not too far from our hometown. People say that it's haunted, or that it was used for horrible experiments. After being the absolute geniuses that we are, we decided to check it out. The lab was a couple of hours away, so we decided to pack up our stuff and get going. After about two hours of driving, 
we finally arrived at an entrance. There was a large gate that seemed to have been broken down, and near it was a restricted area sign. We got out of the car, since we wouldn't be able to get past the gate, and we decided to look around. About 20 feet past the gate was a guard post. It was in pretty bad shape. Although, you can't expect something that's been abandoned for six decades to be in great condition. My friends and I got over the gate, which was pretty easy, since it was bent all the way to the ground. We looked around and saw the lab. It was a fairly large building that looked like it had also seen better days. Surrounding it was a bunch of trees. We were near a forest, so that's to be expected. However, there were what looked like skeletons scattered all over the road leading up to the building. We didn't think much of it, since we thought it was some kind of a prank. We moved forward to the entrance, and the door was busted open with a skeleton laying on the ground near it. What's weird is that the skeleton was split in half, and there was a dried black puddle under it. I was kind of creeped out, but one of my friends said to not worry. I calmed down a little and we went in. As soon as we went in, we could see nothing but destroyed equipment dismembered as skeletons and there was the smell of death that surrounded the building we all felt uneasy and gagged the light didn't work so natural light from the sun and our flashlights were the only source of light that we had after we collected ourselves i had second thoughts about this i told my friends that i don't think we should be here and we should probably just go. But they just looked at me and told me not to be such a baby and let's go. I got upset and hesitantly agreed to continue. We looked around the place and saw nothing but destroyed equipment and skeletons. The interior was this dark room that had a few hallways that each ended in a turn. And in the middle was an entrance to the lab. We looked in the lab and saw more skeletons and equipment. I decided to go into one of the hallways and at the end, I entered what looked to be an area where the people who worked here rested. It was a small room with eight beds and a single desk. I looked on the desk and I saw a journal. It had belonged to one of the scientists. I opened it and read some pages. Since the book was so old, some pages were missing, and the ink seemed to have gotten messed up somehow. I'll tell you all what the journal said. It read as follows. August 12, 1964 my name is Dr. Michael Swatson, and I'm an egghead, as people like to call me. I'm writing in this journal so I can track our progress on Project Pariah. We are tasked with creating a new breed of soldiers who will surpass those commie guys in every way, shape, and form. We are a small team of eight consisting of myself, Dr. Alan McCoy, Dr. Damien Smith, and three armed guards. I'll admit that we have our work cut out for us. It's going to be difficult to create a new breed of soldiers, but I believe it'll all work out with a bit of American ingenuity. August 16th. 1964 
We finally got our subjects after four days. We were supposed to get them earlier, but something happened so they had to delay it. Better late than never, I guess. Our subjects consist of three soldiers. All three were injured during battle. Our goal is to figure out how to make these injured men into killing machines again. Easier said than done, honestly. August 20th, 1964 Things have not been going well these last few days. One of our subjects got sick somehow and had to be taken to a hospital. So, we're stuck with two subjects now and we can't figure out this dang formula. I swear, I'm starting to think something is trying to stop us. August 27th, 1964 Still nothing. We've tried everything we could think of, and still nothing. The one formula we tried on a subject only puts him in a fit of extreme rage, and he ripped one of Alex's balls off. So, we're down a team member now. How can we be this unlucky? September 7th, 1964 I can't take this BS anymore. Nothing we've tried has worked so far. What could we possibly be doing wrong? At this rate, it would be better to just end this project and go nuke Russia. They want to nuke us, so I say, let's just do it to them before they have a chance to do it to us. September 17th, 1964 we finally did it. We actually created super soldiers. After several failed attempts, we decided to use a chemical that we used back in World War II. And by God, our subjects not only became very healthy, but any wounds they sustained were gone. We're running more tests right now, but things seem... Very positive. September 20th, 1964. So it seems that our two subjects have gained increased strength, speed, and intelligence. We put them against our guards who were highly trained in close quarters combat, and they got their butts handed to them by the subjects. One of our guards had his jaw broken and arms nearly ripped off, and were sent to the hospital, but it's a small loss for progress. September 23rd, 1964 Dear God, it seems that these subjects are able to transform on the genetic level. We've spotted them, turning their arms into various things, such as claws or a giant blade. It's truly amazing. With soldiers like this, we could win this war very easily. We're going to collect the samples and send them to Washington too, so they can do their own analysis. September 24th, 1964. Something is wrong. The subjects are acting extremely strange. They haven't moved an inch all day and they won't talk to us. There also seems to be this strange red mist surrounding the room. We're going to send in the guards to check out what's going on. September 24th, 1964 Oh God, something happened. As soon as we opened the doors, they attacked the guards. One of them freaking ate a guard. He bashed the guard's head into the floor, and this weird stuff came out of the subject and pulled the guard's body inside his own. We have locked ourselves in the room, and backup is on the way now. Please, let them arrive soon. September 24th, 
1964. The time is 11.32 p.m. The subjects keep insulting us and told us that if we don't come out, then they would come in. But we soon heard a man telling them to get on the ground. There was gunfire soon after, and then silence. I looked up and saw the mangled bodies of our only backup. All of them were dead, except for the subjects. It seems like this is the end of the line for us. We're going to die. We should have stopped when we had the chance. And that was the last entry. It seems like some sort of experiment went on here and ended terribly. After I finished reading the journal, I decided to keep it and I called for my friends. But there was only silence. I called for them again. Nothing. I was getting annoyed since I thought they were pranking me and told them that they better stop because it isn't funny. I went back into the main hallway and I looked at my watch and saw that it was 11.32 p.m. I couldn't believe that much time had passed and I called for my friends one more time. Still silence. I turned on my flashlight and decided to look around. After a couple of minutes of yelling and looking, I found one of my friend's backpack laying on the ground, covered in blood. I was getting concerned, and I looked around some more. I entered the lab again, and what I saw absolutely shocked me. I saw what looked like a seven foot tall man with claws for hands, holding my friend's mangled body. He noticed me and turned around. His face looked so young yet so old. His eyes were red and he just smiled at me. I still remember what he said to me. Oh, another one here has infiltrated our base. This won't do at all. Get him, boys, he yelled. After that, the skeletons started to violently shake. Flesh and skin started to grow back on them, and they eventually got up. They were decayed, brainless shells of human beings, and I was scared out of my mind. I screamed and ran out of the building as fast as I could but I was surrounded by those uh, things. I grabbed a tree branch and tried hitting them as hard as I could. Luckily, it worked well. So, as I made my way to the car, I kept taking as many of them out as I could. I eventually made it to my vehicle and drove away as fast as I could. I don't know how the heck I survived that, but... I'm glad I did. A few days passed and I started noticing something. A lot of people in my town were acting strange. Almost like something had come over the town and it affected everyone. But that's when I realized one of these subjects had found me. I looked around and I saw him. He was standing in the tree line near my house. He smiled and turned into my friend. I was terrified. I tried to go to the police, but they didn't believe me. No one believed me. Not even my own parents. They thought that I was trying to pull some stupid prank on them. And now, the only thing I can do is explain what happened here. I know that they're coming for me, and that they'll be here soon. I just don't want to give that thing the satisfaction of taking me out. I got accepted to work overnight. Now I'm going to disappear. Written by Thick Potato I was a fool to think that this job was just another job. 
Everything from the advertisement to going and actually applying was way too trivial and inviting. I'm trying to tell myself that I'm going to be okay, but I just don't know. I have some time before it happens, so I'll try to explain how screwed I am. In light of the pandemic that's been around for more than a year at this point, I was extremely tight on money. Having moved out of my parents' house right before everything started shutting down, businesses and any possible sources of income for me was bad enough. But being a college student, on top of that was absolutely not helping my case. For the longest time after leaving California, I lived in one of those $15 a night ran down motels while attending ASU, and life was undeniably a struggle. Cheap housing was fine. I could tolerate the dank and stained mattresses provided in the rooms. Granted, I had been smart enough to take some washable sheets and comforters, as well as per breeze from home. I probably washed those daily because of how hot it would get in those old, barely ventilated rooms. The real problem came from the crime. In the city of Tempe, Arizona, there were almost 1,000 cases of burglary in the year of 2019 alone. Now, granted at that time, the stat didn't scare me because I thought I would be living in the dorms on campus. So, me as a high school senior, I thought nothing of it. But here I am. Four nights before I ended up in my current situation, there is a case of breaking and entering reported from the floor under mine. Someone was apparently abducted and had literally everything taken. The only item that remained was their toothbrush, still neatly placed by the sink of the small bathroom attached to the main room, and the key to the room, which had the name of the person staying there scribbled onto the paper tag. Even their bedsheets were taken, strangely enough. Maybe criminals needed hostages and clean bedsheets. Needless to say, that was enough motivation for me to start making some better financial decisions. I went through four job interviews over the course of the next three days. I was turned on by all four. They said that I lacked intuition. Yesterday morning, however, I came across a neatly organized advertisement online from a company by the name of Mord, M-O-R-D. The bold font stood out from my computer screen, detailing, No experience required. Great pay. Call for interview. From the other advertisement I was looking at, I chose to pursue this one. I felt almost as if it was calling to me, or maybe it was a beacon in my bank account. I called there and then, and after a few rings of the dial tone, the sound of a young woman came through. Hello there. Are you calling about the job advertisements that we put out recently? She asked gingerly. Oh, hey, um, yeah, actually I am. I would, um, I would like to schedule an interview for later today. I stumbled with my words. At times I find it hard to talk to people, and the quarantine was not helping me be any less socially awkward. Is that all right? I ask cautiously. Oh, eager are we now. That's no problem. How can I have your name? It's for filing purposes. She responded, clicking keys on her keyboard. It somehow made my brain tick, but I ignored it as best I could. Yeah, it'll be Jason Brody. Fabulous. I could practically feel that woman smirking at me. The rest of the phone call was somewhat uneventful. I was told the job was hosted in a town somewhat far away from Tempe. For your own safety, I won't tell you which town. I was told that I could show up to the facility around 8pm. This left me with the rest of the day to contemplate my decision. I had somehow just then realized that I didn't even ask what I would be doing at the job. I didn't ask for the girl's name either. Come to think of it, I had never heard of a company by the name of Mord, owning such a big plot of land out where they were located. What did Mord even stand for? At that point, I couldn't really care less. 
I had dollar signs waving in my face, so I hastily went for it. Too bad, too sad, I thought, as I went to prepare for later. I gathered the best clothes I could and I took the evening bus to a stop relatively close to the property. Their facility was sizable, reminiscent of an office building situated out away from everything. It was essentially a desert out here, even though the more urban areas were probably 45 minutes away. Still, there were some buildings scattered out along the road. Mord's, however, was strangely pronounced. Compared to the other dusty buildings, this one looked weirdly clean and pristine in the evening sun. As I got to the front entrance of the building, I was greeted with a reception area. The walls were painted in a bright and reflective shade of white, with black trim which meant a marvelous red carpet with black and white patterns etched into it. It reminded me of a casino show floor. In the mostly empty and spacious room were some white leather couches, some pillars spread equally across the expanse of the room, and some house plants in the corners. A young, blonde girl worked the front desk. A Mr. Brody, I presume, called the girl. Yeah, I'm here. You must be who I spoke with earlier. I responded, doing my best and not to stutter. Although the girl's facial features were hidden by a blue surgical mask, she seemed pleasant. Her nameplate read, Anna, not even a last name. All right, if you had walked down that hall over there, it'll be the first room to the right. She pointed her finger to a hallway to the right of me. Much thanks, I replied. By her voice, I assumed she was probably in her early 20s, probably working some lame job to get money, similar to how I was. Inside of the room was a wooden desk and some chairs. The decorative pattern of the lobby was seemed to flow into the office rooms as well. On the desk laid a piece of paper and an envelope. Cautiously, I took up the paper. It read, Mord. Room 2. Good evening, Jason. It is truly unfortunate that I couldn't see you in person before you start. As you should know by now, you will be working overnight in our facility as an overnight guard. As mentioned in the advertisement, the pay should be satisfactory. You will receive $1,500 US dollars per working night. If you couldn't tell by my phrasing, you have already been hired. You will start tonight. Your job is quite easy as long as you follow the company rules. The envelope next to this page should contain said rules. Failure to comply with these rules may lead to unforeseen consequences for you, so be sure to work diligently. Your uniform can be found under the chair behind you in the corner. You will find your post for tonight using the map of the building provided on the back of this page. Be at your post by 11.30pm tonight. You may spend the time leading up to your shift in any way you'd like. Do not go down the stairs. Aaron I laughed at the last comment. Way to be ominous, I thought. It was about 8pm, then so I decided to get some rest in before my shift. I slept in the chair where I had originally picked up my uniform. The pay was enough to cover my tuition in a matter of weeks. No way I was turning back. My alarm rang at 11.20pm. I shot up, put on my uniform and followed the detailed fire escape route map of the building to my post. Aaron had kindly used a red marker to guide me through the hallways. I arrived at my post by 11.26pm, just enough time for me to take a quick glance at the rules. I figured that since I had been hired on the spot, I was in no rush to fret over these. The paper contained a list of 14 rules. The first rules were modest. Rule number one. From a time period of 11.30pm to the end of your shift at 6am, you must walk the ground floor as perimeter twice. You may choose the intervals at which these patrols happen. Easy enough. Rule number two. From a time period of 2am to 3.33am, you must take a patrol of the second floor. Walking the perimeter suffices as a patrol. 
Hmm, that's oddly specific. Rule number three. You will also be tasked with observing the CCTV camera stationed around the building. If you observe anything you would consider abnormal, please use the phone in your room to contact the front desk. They will know what to do. Connection number 999. I sighed. It's whatever I thought. It must be some new guy hazing ritual. It reminds me of when my old burger joint used to decorate for Halloween. Oddly spooky. I laughed internally. Maybe they're just reusing some old supplies from Halloween. But it's March though. I shrugged it off. Taking a look at my watch, it was now 11.30. I was officially on the clock. Looking up, I observed the room that I had been stationed in. In contrast with the rooms on the first floor, the red carpet that had been present throughout the greater part of the building did not go past the doorframe. Rather, this room had a bleak gray carpet, a color reminiscent of wet concrete. The walls of this room were a faded white, numerous maroon stains laid in contrast from the color of the wall. Some long stains even followed out of the ceiling. Exactly across from the metal door was an industrial metal table. On the table sat 12 monitors, stacked 4x3. Next to the pile laid a beige office phone. In the corner of my room to my right were four blue lockers. In the other corner of the room, there is a small yellow bin with something black inside of it. Hmm, classy. Flipping around, I decided to go out for my first patrol right off the bat. I took the envelope with the rules and I kept reading. Rule number four. For your own safety before exiting your room for a patrol, look through all the camera feeds and then refer to rule number three. <laughs> oh crap. I found it almost comical that this company was talking about my safety after all. Aren't I supposed to be the most dangerous thing in the building? I'm pretty sure that I saw a baton in the bin. I didn't grab it though. I found it funny how I kept messing up. Legitimately comical. Rule number five. While on patrol, you might encounter rooms where the doors are open and people are seemingly moving inside, but the lights inside the room are turned off. Do not enter these rooms. Do not shine your flashlight in these rooms. They don't like light. I stopped dead in my tracks, almost falling over with how hard I planted my feet into the ground. I had read the rule over two more times thinking that I had misinterpreted it or something. I started to feel the creeping sensation of fear enter my body. Logically, this had to be a prank. It had to. I had too many thoughts to portray under this note, but I kept reading. Rule number six. If you are on patrol and you encounter one of these rooms, and something seems to be exiting the room, do not look at it. If you must, stare at the ground and walk backwards until you can turn around and get back to your room quickly. Refer to rule number three before finishing that round of patrol. Rule number seven. If you are in a room and you hear scratching at your door, almost as if a pet were beckoning to be let in, do not open the door. If these scratches intensify, you must ignore them. Do not attempt to look out the small window in the door. It is best if you keep your back to the door. Rule number eight. If you notice that one of the cameras in your room has gone black or has started to show static, you must take the baton that was provided to you and smash the screen of the monitor. It can get in otherwise. Try to smash only that screen. The top of the monitor frame is labeled accordingly to where the camera was displaying. You must avoid that area whenever patrolling. Rule number nine, if you sense something is following you, run into your room. Chances are it can't get past the door. Rule 10, if something manages to break into your room, remain completely and utterly still wherever you are and drop whatever you're doing. Do not open your eyes. It'll try to coerce you. Rule number 11, at no point before 6am should you consider leaving the premises of the building. 
You are locked in for your safety. I sharply inhaled upon the realization that I was locked in. This was undeniably the fastest my heart has ever beat. I was practically gagging at my own tongue. I wanted to say something to calm myself down, but I couldn't find the words. I managed to get a hold of myself soon after. Until the ground floor's light shut off. I was surrounded by darkness. I stumbled backwards a few steps to find the wall of the hallway. I was utterly blinded by the darkness. I fumbled with the utility belt in my uniform, trying to find which small pocket housed the flashlight. I got a hold of it after a moment, switched it on, and all I could think to do was look around me. Wide-eyed, I turned several 360s before considering taking a step forward to trudge onward. The lights must be on a timer, I thought. Shining my light onto my black analog watch, the time read, 11.40 p.m., this is absolutely terrible. As subtle as a mouse, I crept onward. In a foot race, an ant probably could have beat me to the end of the hallway. I hadn't realized it before, but this building was quite expansive. In each hallway, there seemed to be doorways to at least 25 rooms in total, and the hallways were probably each 150 feet long. The building was laid out like a grid with hallways connecting at certain intervals every now and again, making it easy to navigate, since they were all right angles. Having not encountered anything for the first 10 minutes of creeping, I quickened my pace to a slow walk. Surprisingly, I had made a complete perimeter of the ground floor in about 45 minutes, while not having seen anything. Perhaps it was because I didn't dare to make a sound or look at anything but the hallway in front of me, but I made it back to my room safely. I peered around the room. Nothing seemed to be hiding inside. Stepping in, I closed the door behind me. My watch read, 12.44 a.m. Suddenly, the office phone on the table blared its ringtone, almost stumbling over from a heart attack. I inched closer to the phone. I put my hand in the handheld and held the speaker to my ear. The voice of a man came through. Hello, how are you? Asked the man in a deep and slow voice. Um, it's good. Who are you? Ignoring my question, the man continued. Static from the phone erupted briefly. Wait, I, uh, what do you mean? I was sufficiently flustered. What, uh, like religion? Uh, I'm an atheist. There is a brief pause. What is your name? Asked the man. He sounded cold and lifeless now. There was no inflection left in his voice. His breathing was shallow. Like his diaphragm could no longer push enough air out of his mouth. Um, Jason. The man's voice became distorted past what I could ever possibly try to describe. It was similar to someone choking or gargling on some thick liquid. It hurt my heart to hear somehow, but it was talking to me through the distortion. I didn't know what it was saying. The phone line cut out. It was eerily silent all around me now, and then it dinged on me. I whipped the envelope out and scanned the rules for anything mentioning a phone. I read, Rule 13. If the phone in your station begins to ring, you must answer it. Answer any questions it may ask. If it hangs up before you do, resume duties. If it asks you for your name, do not answer. Hang up and resume duties. My heart dropped. I really had nothing running through my head right at that moment other than dread. From the silence came a knock at the room's door. I flipped around instantly to face it. Before taking a step forward, I looked at the paper with the rules again. Rule 14. 
If there is a knocking coming from the door to your room, it is most likely the result of not following one of the previously mentioned rules. Refer to Rule 7. If the handle of the door begins to jingle, refer to Rule 10. Mai looked up to the door. The handle to the door had silently been turning, and I had not noticed. I dropped the envelope somewhere on the ground from surprise. I instantly shut my eyes and I crouched down, trying to find it by feeling the ground. I heard the door start to creak open, its metal hinges squeaking. Planting both hands on the carpet, I prepared for what was about to unfold. What I felt at first was a strange aura. It became seemingly colder inside of the room, but my body remained warm. Strange sensations coated my arms and legs, the kind where it tangles, and you would expect to find a spider crawling on you, but there's nothing there. My head felt unfathomably hot compared to the other parts of my body, and that's when it spoke. Its voice was reminiscent to that of the thing that spoke to me on the phone. However, it was not gargling. It had the same vocal tone as the thing on the phone. But this time, it spoke with inflection and an accent. It sounded human. Hey, it's okay. Open your eyes and come with me. It repeated that phrase several times and then almost as if it were perplexed by why I wasn't responding. It started speaking again, this time in German, and then in what I assumed to be Russian, and then in an ancient language that I didn't recognize. And then it went silent, but the feeling in my body was still present, along with the intense cramping of my muscles. I didn't dare open my eyes. I remained in my crouched position for what seemed like an eternity. When these sensations in my body have subsided, I finally mustered up the courage to open my eyes. There was no monster from anything I could see. The door remained wide open. The light that illuminated my small room of salvation spilled into the hallway outside. I shot up and I closed the door as quickly and quietly as I could. Somehow thinking that it might still be outside somewhere. I don't remember exactly how I felt, but deprived of oxygen from forgetting to breathe is somewhat accurate. I was sweating profusely and trying to get a hold of my breath. My watch read 1.02am. Spotting the envelope on the ground, I bent over and went to review the rules. Glancing over the ones that I've already read, I recalled the cameras. Looking to the table, I began to switch on the monitors one by one, with the small on-off button next to the label of where the camera was shooting. All the camera feeds displayed as seemingly still images of the long and dark hallways, except for one, which displayed one room in a hallway with the lights on inside. I figured this must have been the camera shooting footage of my hallway, and that illuminated room was the one that I was in. The label on the monitor read, Hallway 4. Correlating that to the map Aaron had given me, it seems I was mistaken. I was located in Hallway 3. I seeming as none of the rules I had read so far mentioned the lights being on, I looked down at the phone to call the front desk. Before picking up the receiver, I hesitated. Almost as if the monster from earlier would start asking questions again but I dialed 9 three times, and a dial tone began to sound. After three tones, the voice of a young man came through. Hello, front desk representative speaking. He spoke with a distinct southern accent. Hey, there's a, well, in hallway number four, there's a room with a light on. I responded, trying to keep it together. Almost snottily, the man retorted. Is that truly abnormal? There are consequences for calling this line without a reason. I didn't enjoy his tone. You listen to me. I have seen my fair share of abnormal stuff tonight. Don't you try to tell me. He gave in after my one sentence verbal assault. We'll send someone over. However, 
I don't think that southern guy ever sent anyone. I never saw anyone walk through that hallway for the next 20 minutes. I guess I'll figure it out myself, I thought. Before I left the room, I remembered to grab the baton that sat in the bin in the corner of the room. Opening the door, I peered out, looking left and right as if I were crossing the street, and I headed over to hallway number four. Nothing seemed to be out of place though. No doors were open, and the lights remained off. I guess I made it this far, I might as well do my second patrol. Through the rest of my patrol, I encountered two of the rooms described by rule number five. I heeded the warning of the rule and simply walked past the room without investigating inside. Those rooms were truly strange though. Walking past the room, it sounded similar to the inside of a populated mall or a train station, where there was a lot of bustling. I took a quick glance inside one of these rooms as I passed it in the hallway. Through the darkness, I could see movement, but I couldn't relate it to anything that I could comprehend. It had the form of a black mass, swirling around. Moving on, I walked down a flight of stairs, figuring I would do an extra good job and continue onward. Everything seemed darker down there, but it was reminiscent of a copy of the ground floor from what I could remember. My feet made a small squishing sound while walking. The floor seemed to be slightly flooded by a thin layer of water. I felt like I had a bad night blindness down there. My flashlight seemed to lose power as well, or something to that extent, because the beam dimmed the further that I walked. It smelled old, rotting wood and rusty metal. It was also quite humid, like an indoor swimming pool. I felt some of the water from the ground soak my running shoes. My hands were starting to get clammy, and the air seemed to get heavier with each step, compressing my chest and making it hard to breathe. I looked at my watch. It seemed to have stopped working as well. The time remained frozen at 1.07 a.m., but I knew it was way later than that, though. I stopped where I was, and I leaned against one of the hallway walls. Pulling out the envelope, I gazed upon the rules. Rule 12 was quite vague. Rule 12. You are always being deceived. Remember. This left me quite confused. I flipped over the rules paper. Written in a pronounced bold font, sat Rule 15. Rule 15. Do not go down the stairs. A basement floor does not exist in this building. Upon descending the stairs, your safety cannot be guaranteed. In fact, our company does not exactly know what happens upon descending the stairs, and we only know the result. Thus, we do not yet understand how to effectively combat this. You have a limited amount of time to pray to your deity of choice, because you have just entered a portal to the fourth circle of hell. I felt my legs give out a little. I looked to the darkness ahead of me, behind me and all around me. I yelled from fear and backtracked as fast as I could. I jumped up three stairs at a time and hauled absolute butt back to my room. I ripped the lockers in the corner of the room from the wall and I barricaded the door. I already tried redialing the phone. No one picked up. I don't know what's approaching me, but I can feel it. It's different than the creature which had knocked on the door. My body is in pain, aching and writhing, burning. I can sense it and it can sense me. It's coming to take me. I can see it in my head. Dark and disfigured, eyeless, pale, soulless and satanic. I'm scared. I don't know what to do. I don't understand why I'm here. I don't understand why this is happening to me. Please, whoever may be reading my warning, if you ever agree to a job that seems too good to be true, it is. Good luck sleeping tonight after listening to that story. Now, before we continue into our next tale, 
I want to talk about another one of today's sponsors, Audible. Audible is home to the largest selection of audiobooks ranging from bestsellers to new releases. I find myself using Audible constantly throughout my day, whether I'm doing chores around the house or driving in my car. The convenience that Audible provides is unbeat. As many of you would imagine, I am a big fan of anything related to the horror genre, Stephen King especially. I just recently finished listening to the Institutes on Audible, which I greatly enjoyed, and now I plan to start on The Outsider. With Audible's vast collection of titles, you never have to worry about running out of amazing stories to experience. With your Audible membership, you can download titles and listen offline, anytime and anywhere. It's a great way to stay entertained while on the go. To get started with your 30-day free trial, visit audible.com slash creepscast or text creepscast to 500-500. Again, that's audible.com slash creepscast or text creepscast to 500-500 to start your 30-day free trial. Thank you again, Audible, for sponsoring today's episode. And now, back to the stories. We made contact with intelligent life. It was a huge mistake. Written by Narciso. My name is Virgil, and I'm going to tell you about a series of events that happened to me over the last couple of months. The reason for this is because I feel like I don't have much time left, and I want people to know what's happened to me. You see, I never believed in the idea that there was life on other planets. I always thought that if there were, they would surely visit us either out of curiosity or just the need to destroy something. This all started back in November when I was a senior in college. I wasn't exactly a popular student. The only people who I could really consider friends were a couple freshmen named Cody and another senior named Yuri. Cody had always been a really shy person. He has pretty poor social skills and he sort of just latched onto me. I didn't really mind it because I know what it's like to be shy. Yuri, on the other hand, is sort of the opposite of Cody. He's a social butterfly, for lack of a better word. He wants to be friends with everyone he meets, which kind of leads him to annoying people, because he never really stops trying. It was a pretty normal day. I went to my classes and then I hung out with Cody and Yuri. We were walking in the hallway when I found a pamphlet on the wall. It was an advertisement for a program that needed volunteers for a special project. It said that you would earn extra credit for participating and be paid 500 bucks. What the project was wasn't described in the pamphlet, but it had me interested nonetheless. A little extra credit and some money didn't sound bad. So, I looked at the location it was in, a part of the school that I had never heard of before. My college wasn't huge and it went by zones. Zone 1 was where the dorms were, Zone 2 was for classes, and Zone 3 was where everyone went to eat lunch. The pamphlet stated Zone 4, which I never knew even existed. A couple of hours later, I tried to look up Zone 4 in my college, and I had managed to find an old map in the library that had mentioned the area. It said that Zone 4 was about a mile out from my college, which was odd. Why did it add this area so far away from the campus? I didn't think too much about it, so I got ready and I got on my bike. It was about 5 p.m. when I had reached the area. It didn't really look like a college campus. It looked more like a lab of some sort. It was a relatively large building with a giant antenna on the top. There was a car parked out front and three people standing by the entrance. 
One was a woman, who looked pretty short. She had long black hair and green eyes, and seemed pretty nervous. The second was a man who was the tallest of all of us. He had short brown hair and blue eyes and a slim figure. And finally, there was another guy. He was around my height, and he was bald. He was the strangest of the group. He had gray eyes, and he looked at the other two, with a suspicious look, it seemed. Like he didn't trust anyone. He stood away from the others and looked at me with a dead expression on his face. I got off my bike and I walked to the two and introduced myself. Hi, I'm, I'm Lily, the woman said in a nervous tone. She didn't look at me when she talked. Her voice was really soothing. Hey, I'm Alex, the tall man said while shaking my hand. He seemed like a decent person and he had a confident vibe to him. I asked about the bald guy and Alex told me that his name is Quinn and to not to pay any attention to him. He keeps to himself mostly and he hasn't even said a word to anyone. About five minutes pass and someone opens the door and tells us to come in. And we all walked in and we looked around. The first floor of the building was the reception area. It was a somewhat ran down looking area with a desk and an old looking computer on top. The walls were a depressing gray and the floors were white tile. There were no windows except for the door and the lights that weren't very bright. The person who had told us to come in was the secretary. She was a tall woman with curly blonde hair and a somewhat uneasy smile. It was almost like she was hiding something. She told us in a chipper voice that the head of the project would be here shortly and to wait here. We all nodded our heads and we waited about 15 minutes. There was a somewhat disturbing aura to this whole thing. I couldn't put my finger on it at the time. The head finally arrived and we were greeted by a short man in a lab coat. He looked to be in his mid-forties and he had a black beard. His eyes were piercing and he was missing a hand. Hello, my name is Dr. Popowitz, he said in a cheerful tone. His voice was deep and rough. Thank you all for participating in Project Orion. The purpose of this project is to prove that we are not alone in the universe. That somewhere deep within this solar system... There is a civilization of beings who we will welcome with open arms. He was really passionate about what he just said. We all sort of looked at him with confusion. Now, I know that I probably seem, well, crazy, but I assure you that I'm not. He sounded a little nervous when he had said that. Anyways, please follow me and I'll give you all the tour of the building. We all looked at each other and I gave a shrug and we then proceeded to follow the doctor. He showed us around the complex, telling us about the various rooms and gave a little insight into his life. He had been looking for signs of extraterrestrial life for over 25 years, and he believes that he finally might be onto something, and he's going to need our help. Of course, I thought that this guy was out of his mind, but hey, a little money couldn't hurt. After showing us around, he finally stopped in a large room. There were monitors everywhere, and some kind of radio, it looked like, in the center of the room. Man, this is where you'll be helping me. It's pretty simple work. You all will be watching these monitors for three days, and if you see or hear anything, then speak into the intercom here. And he points to the intercom on the wall. Now, I should mention that none of you are allowed to expose the purpose of this project. I've worked too hard to get to where I am now and I can't have anyone finding out what this is. We all nodded and he showed us to our respective monitors. He told us what each button does and then proceeded to walk off. I looked around and everyone was doing their job. Except for Quinn. He just kept looking at me. Actually, now that I think of it, 
I don't think he ever stopped looking at me. I felt uneasy and I tried to ignore him. And I looked at my monitor. There was nothing but stars and distant planets. It was rather peaceful, honestly. After a few hours, we heard Dr. Popowitz speak through a speaker. You may all go home. Please return tomorrow at 6 p.m. I groaned and got up and I walked out of the room. I checked my phone and it was 1 a.m. I was pretty tired, so I went back to my dorm. As I was walking out, I saw Quinn staring at me again. I got annoyed and asked him why he won't stop looking at me. He didn't reply. He just kept looking. For a second, I could have sworn that his eyes had changed colors. I got fed up and I walked out of the building. Nothing happened on the second day. It was the final day when... It actually happened. I still remember the exact date and time. November 30th, at 11.21pm. I was looking at my monitor when suddenly... A weird noise had started up. It was garbled. We all looked around and realized that the radio was on. It seems like it picked up some kind of transmission. My eyes widened and I ran to the intercom and told the doctor that we think we had found something. In mere seconds, he dashed into the room and I explained what happened. He ran to the radio and began frantically saying, Hello, is there someone there? After a few attempts, someone or something spoke. Why have you contacted us? The voice was deep and unsettling. I, I don't mean any harm. My name is Dr. Popowitz, and I'm from the planet Earth. We wanted to prove that we weren't alone in the universe. The doctor seemed really excited. I couldn't believe that we actually made contact with other life. Everything I thought was a lie. I felt excitement and fear. Earth, that loathsome little planet, the voice replied. Yes, for so many years I've waited for this moment. Please, may we see what you look like? The doctor was in a state of pure bliss. After a few seconds of silence, the monitors went black. They came back on shortly after, and that's when we saw them. We looked out in fear as we saw the faces of the beings that we had made contact with. They had long, slim bodies and their heads were unnaturally round and smooth. Their eyes were a deep shade of red. It was almost hypnotizing. They had no mouth and yet they could speak. Their skin was like baby blue and they had claws for hands. I felt a pit on my stomach and I started to question if this was the right thing to do. I looked at the others and they all shared the same look as me. Except for Popowitz and Quinn. They had a look of excitement as if this was what they had wanted. The doctor starts laughing like an insane man and then turns to us. All my work has finally paid off. They called me insane. Those idiots. Now I prove that we are not alone. He could barely contain his joy. Suddenly, the building started shaking and the creature said, <laughs> Your curiosity will be your undoing. A portal on the roof started to open. And soon after, one of those things landed on the floor. He towered over all of us and just stared. Popowitz's expression went from joy to pure fear in an instant. What, what do you mean? He asked. The creature turned around and looked at him. And then he picked the doctor up without actually touching him. What, what are you doing? Put me down. He demanded, but the creature would not listen. We all watched as the creature slammed the doctor into the wall several times with incredible force. All we could hear was the sounds of bones being crushed 
and drywall cracking. He finally tosses the doctor into the monitors. They all crackle and glass flies everywhere. We all gasped and I began to shake. I tried to run, but my body was frozen. It was as if that monster had kept us from being able to run. The being looked over at Quinn, and it walked to him. He still had that smile on his face, and he finally spoke. It's about time. His voice had an echo to it, and his body began to change into his true form. You wouldn't believe how long I'd been here, Quinn said as he looked at us. The good doctor finally got the proof that he wanted to. It's too bad he won't live to tell it, and neither will any of you. Every fiber of my being wanted to run. I looked over to Lily and Alex, and they were petrified. Lily began to sob, and Alex said, You, why are you doing this? Quinn looked at him and explained, Oh, it's simple, really. I crashed here five years ago and needed to get back. However, my transmitter was broken, so I had no way to get back or to contact my people. So I took some human's body and wandered around this pitiful planet until I finally found the late doctor. He was obsessed with finding extraterrestrial life, so I tricked him into doing all of this and he outlived his usefulness. I leave no loose ends. Alex clenched his fist and wanted to attack Quinn and the other being. He ran towards them, but before he could even land a finger on one of them, they grabbed him and began to slowly rip him apart. Lily began screaming and she ran out of the room. I followed her. All we heard was the sound of screaming and flesh being torn. The lights went out and we were left in total darkness. Lily was panicking and I was trying to calm her down. Those, those things, they just, they killed him without a second thought. Lily was on the verge of hyperventilating and I couldn't blame her. I was trying to control my fear, but it was getting harder every second. I looked past Lily's shoulder and saw two pairs of red eyes. God, Lily, we need to run now. I told her as I grabbed her hand and pulled her with me. I didn't know where I was going, but I was in pure survival mode. We just ran and ran in what felt like an endless maze of corridors. But every second I ran the closer those things fell to me. After what felt like an eternity, I saw an elevator light. I told Lily to follow me, and we ran to the elevator and pressed the button as fast as we could. Come on, come on, come on, hurry up. I was breathing heavily, and so was Lily. The elevator finally arrived and we ran in. However, as the door was about to close, one of the creatures grabbed Lily and pulled her out. All I heard was her screaming as the door closed and it took me to the first floor. I tried to take a moment to calm myself, but I couldn't. I thought I was going to die here that they would be on the first floor waiting for me. The elevator pinged and the door slowly opened. I was glad to see the exit sign above the front door. I ran as fast as I could to the exit, and with all my strength, I slammed the door open and fell onto the ground. I wasn't even thinking. I just ran and ran and ran. I even left my bike. I somehow managed to get out of there. But I was the only one, the sole survivor. After what felt like forever, I finally made it back to my dorm. As soon as I had opened the door, I passed out and didn't wake up for several hours. When I did wake up, I was in the nurse's office. Cody and Yuri were by my side and I never felt so good to see them. They asked me what had happened and I told them what actually happened. About Popowitz, the creatures, Lily and Alex. They thought that I was crazy, but I told them that I was telling the truth, and that I would even show them. After I was better, I told them that I would show them Zone 4, and we got into Yuri's car and we drove there. What I saw shocked me. The building was gone. There was no trace of it, just trees. 
They asked if I got the right location. I told them that I knew this was where Zone 4 was. But it was like there was never anything there at all. Yuri told me that I must have imagined it or something. And we drove back to college. No one believed me, but I know what I saw. Weeks went by and I still had nightmares about what had happened. I could still see the faces of those things. I could still hear the screaming. I even heard them taunting me. Their voices echoed in my mind. I felt like I was going to go insane. I finally had had enough and I wanted to just get away from everything. So I decided to drop out of college and just move away. Surprisingly, it worked. I didn't have nightmares or anything. I didn't even hear their voices. Until a couple of days ago, that is. I mentioned earlier that the reason I'm writing this was because I felt like I didn't have much time left until they found me. Well, they did. I started hearing the voices again, and I saw flashes of them taking me in various ways. I should have known there would be no escape. Even as I type this out, I can hear their voices echo in my head. Believe me or don't, it doesn't matter anymore. I'll see you soon, Quinn. If you wake up at night, never look outside your windows. Written by Hayvale Recently, I got a vacation for my work. Two beautiful weeks of relaxation and self-care just for me. Of course, the pandemic had forced me to change my initial plan of traveling and actually doing stuff. But free time is always welcomed in my book. I spent most of my days and nights playing video games or binging series and movies. As usual, this also caused my sleep schedule to become an irregular mess. I would go to sleep and wake up at all hours of the day or night, which put me on the receiving hand of a lot of judgment for my roommates and best friends, Nicholas and Jess. One night, I woke up a bit after 3 a.m. I had just had around six hours of sleep and I was totally parched. Not wanting to wake anyone else up, I tiptoed to the kitchen, keeping all the lights off. I had been living in this house for four years now. I could navigate it with my eyes closed. With a glass of water filled to the brim in hand, I started tiptoeing around Batu where I came from. As I was walking to my room, a chill ran down my spine. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but this weird sensation filled my body, like my guts were telling me something was wrong. Wary of my surroundings, I stood in the darkness of my living room, trying to understand the source of this feeling. Failing to comprehend what was happening, I dismissed the feeling as nothing more than a product of my half-asleep mind. Being alone in the dark certainly helped my brain fill every corner of my house with shadow monsters and spooky ghosts. My eyes had adjusted to the darkness by now, revealing the truth of the monsters and ghosts as being common objects. Looking around the room with half a smile plastered on my face, as I laughed at myself for being scared of the dark, I noticed a person standing under the streetlight in front of our house. I felt safe inside, so instead of fear, my head was filled with questions about who he could be and what was his purpose here at night. And curiosity made me stare at him, trying to understand the mystery that he now represented in my mind. Anyway, with no light turned on, I was practically invisible from the outside. I think that it was a man, but his morphology wasn't clear from that distance. He was wearing dark jeans, a black hoodie, and black gloves. He was just standing there under the street lamp looking down. I remember thinking to myself, What in the world is that weirdo doing? With a light chuckle, 
My false sense of security made the situation nothing more than a funny anecdote I could tell Nicholas and Jess in the morning. It all took a turn when he slowly lifted his head, like a robot being activated for the first time. His face was in sight, but I couldn't see any of his features from where I stood. I took a step toward the window and then stopped. His head started moving from left to right, up and down, taking his time like he was scanning our house looking for something. When he stopped, my curiosity was immediately replaced by fear. He was staring at the living room window. At me. There's no way you can see me. You can't see me. You can't see me. I whispered in the dark, trying to convince myself. Yet somehow I knew that he could see me. What now? Oh, what will his reaction be? I have no idea how long we watched each other without any movement. The anticipation started rising, and my heart beat with it. It felt like an out-of-body experience watching myself, staring at him and he at me. And then in a flash, he sprinted towards our front door. Letting go of the glass I was holding, I started to run towards the front door to make sure that it was indeed locked. I didn't even hear it crashing into a million pieces on the floor, as my survival instinct was screaming at me to get to that door. At that moment, I got a view of him under my porch light. I couldn't make out his features because there weren't any for me to see. He wore an entirely white mask, hiding his identity. I stared at him while he took a step back, and another, and another still looking at me, before he sprinted again towards the side of the house. The back door, I murmured before running towards the only other access that he could use. Again, the door was locked. In my head, I thanked Jess's OCD behavior about safety. Again, he appeared and tried to open the door once again. When he couldn't, he took a step back like earlier. But this time... He raised his left hand, showing three fingers before lowering one. He then walked away in a nonchalant demeanor. I followed him with the windows until he was out of sight. I just collapsed on myself and started bawling like a baby, proceeding to wake Nicholas and Jess in the process. Between my tears and wheezing, I explained what had happened. Jess hugged me while Nicholas chastised me for not screaming to wake them both up. I was too shocked to answer him, but if the sound of glass shattering and me sprinting around the house didn't wake them, then I doubt screaming would have. We proceeded to call the police and tell my story for the second time that night, but the cops never found anything, and only said that they would patrol the area more often. I wish I could say that that was it, that I lived to tell the tale and write a pretty the end to my story. But in retrospect, that was merely the prelude of my torment. The next day, I was still stressed but fairly over it. As scary as it was at the time, it was only a failed home invasion attempt. The only thing that bothered me was him lowering his finger. What was that all about? I mumbled out loud before being interrupted by Nicholas. Crazy people do crazy stuff, Nat. And don't torture yourself trying to understand and just get over it. Empathy wasn't one of Nicholas's strong points, and at that moment, I really wanted his face to meet a chair. But still, I tried to follow his advice and I focused my mind on other things. But it didn't stop me from waking up around 3 a.m. again. As soon as I had opened my eyes, I felt it. That gut feeling again telling me that I wasn't safe. My first thought was that I was having some sort of PTSD from the night before. So I did some breathing exercises and I tried to calm down. My chest felt heavy like a weight was sitting on it as I tried to breathe in. 
I timed my breath, counting every second of inhalation and expiration, just to focus my mind on something. After a couple of minutes, I realized that no amount of breathing exercises would make the feeling go away. All I knew was that I was in danger somehow. I sat alone in the dark, alert, trying to convince myself again that I was only experiencing residual feelings from the night before. And that's when my eyes wandered to my closed blinds. I wondered if the man was there again. What if he's waiting for me? What if I open my blinds and all I see is his face pressed up against the glass? Those thoughts plagued my mind for a minute, before I decided that the only way I could go back to sleep was to make sure that I was safe, and that meant looking outside and hopefully seeing nothing. I rose a shaking hand toward the edge of my window. Just a little push would let me see outside, and at the same time, expose me to it. That awareness put a stop at my already low momentum. I didn't want to take any risk. So, with my back to the wall, I raised my phone behind the blinds and recorded a video of what was going on outside. Just a couple of seconds of recording right before hopping back in the safety of my bed, like some invisible monster would snatch my feet if I stood too long. I stared at my phone, my thumb hovering over the play button. I think my instinct was trying to tell me not to watch that video and just go back to trying to sleep, but my fear decided otherwise. I took a deep breath and I reviewed the footage. To my horror, the man was there already scanning every window in the house looking for whatever he wanted, which I assumed was me. I curled into a ball feeling that terror overwhelmed me. I took my phone and I dialed 911, but the line wouldn't connect. Every other application I tried weren't working either. Tears filled my eyes. I needed someone to help me. I couldn't face this alone. Desperate, I started to crawl out towards Nicholas's bedroom. I didn't want to scream to wake him in case the crazy guy would hear me. And standing up was also not an option. I needed to be impossible to see from outside. Like my leg had been suddenly disabled, I moved forward, one pull at a time toward the next room, while still being mindful of where my gaze would land upon hoping not to see the man staring at me with his featureless mask. Exhausted and panicked, I reached my roommate's room. Nicholas, wake up. The crazy guy is here. He's back again. I whispered loudly as I started getting up. The only answer I got was my heart pumping away in my ears as I noticed his bed was empty. I had seen him go to bed after he had wished me a good night. He was supposed to be here. There wasn't anywhere else that he could be. My mind immediately went to Jess. I had to make sure that she was safe. Throwing away discretion, I ran down the stairs to the basement. I couldn't help but let out a small sigh of relief when I found her in her bed, snoring away. Jess, Jess, the guy is back. I can't find Nick anywhere. I think something might have happened to him. In my panic state, I shook her violently by the shoulders. But neither my words nor my action ended her deep sleep. Without any warning, she stopped breathing, and her body started to dissolve into a fine dust. And then there was tapping. Tap, tap, tap. I froze in place. Tap, tap, tap. I knew that it was him trying to get my attention. Tap, tap, tap. But I refused to look at him. I kept my eyes closed. There was a last set of tapping and then nothing. Was he gone? I dared to look outside. 
He had left, but a message was there in his place. In the foggy basement window of Jess's room was a crossed out two, followed by a one. That's when it hit me. The three fingers the man held up the night before. It was me, Jess, and Nick. And now I was the only one left. That was a couple of hours ago. Others have joined him outside. There are about 50 people, all wearing the same blank mask in front of my house. I feel like they can see me through the walls or, or something, because wherever I go in the house, I can feel their eyes on me. I barricaded myself in my room with a little bit of food and water, but I don't think that it matters anymore. I searched the internet for any information that could possibly help me. I did find some other people that had been claimed to have been stalked by people with the same blank mask. They would always post once or twice about it before never writing anything again. One guy even posted a video of these people surrounding him, chanting some kind of sentence over and over again. People in the comments said it sounded something cryptic. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but I'll put it on the screen. But I have no idea what it could mean. The crowd have been saying something in unison for the last hour or so. I can't hear it well, but it sounds similar to the video that I watched. I just hope my story can help someone in the future. The house just started shaking. I think whatever they are calling upon is coming. There is no hope for me. Dad, Mom, Jessica, Nicholas. I'm sorry. And I love you. There is a secret Mars biome. They discovered a new form of death. Written by Kyle Harrison. By the time we had arrived at the crash site, little was left of the capsule save for the radiation. All of us were ordered to wear our protective suits as we appraised the crater. I had never seen this sort of destruction on the ocean floor before. It was as though the pot had caused a rupture in the environment itself, killing all life around it and leaving nothing but a black hole. Everything about the site told me that this was an omen of dark times. The circumstances didn't allow for me to wonder what had happened here, as I knew that several other international agencies were already searching for the remaining cargo. This was a monumentous discovery, regardless of how tragic it was that the crash had caused so much damage. And despite my misgivings and fears, I had to push forward. Pushing the rover deeper, I maneuvered the arms on either side to unlatch the cargo hold of the pod, giving clear access to my deep sea camera. We could make out five large steel crates that would change our scientific understanding of the red planet forever. Get him up to the surface ASAP. We've got the helicopters ready. A voice said over my comm. That was my supervisor, Paul Baker, reminding me again this was no time for sentimentality. Work still needed to be done. Using the rover's claws like arms, I maneuvered my own undersea drone to grab a hold of one crate and I pulled it out. A rush of air and bubbles releasing pressure. It still felt unreal to recognize that what I was holding did not come from our Mother Earth. Pushing the engines into reverse, I pulled away from the murky depths to reach our transport above. It was time to make history, for history to decide what our role would be. Three hours and 3,000 miles later, we were back at the Hive. 
To describe it would be nearly impossible to the uneducated person, but it is both a technological masterpiece and a thing of beauty all at once. Its official name is the Mars Terrestrial Habitation Biome Number 4. But my good friend and occasional romantic partner, Dr. Anna White, coined the term hive last spring, and the name has stuck ever since. She was there waiting for me when we had returned with the cargo, fully suited up and ready to take it into the facility. Security was on high alert. No one knew for sure what had caused the capsule to break, and we still hadn't heard from the Ackley too, the Mars side of our project, since the incident began. I knew our supervisors didn't want a repeat of what had happened on the moon less than a year ago, so every precaution was being taken. I shudder to think of those and nightmarish accounts again. Anna and three security teams arrived to check the cargo. As I ensued and prepared for depressurization, the top half of the hive was designed for a habitation that we humans are accustomed to. This is where I would need to spend the next six hours to rest from my deep sea excursion. But it would be difficult, especially because I knew Anna would likely not wait for me to begin the next round of soil samples and atmospheric tests within the biome. Promise you won't make any discoveries without me, I teased. She gave me a childish grin and looked like she had just won the lottery. I didn't hold her to any vows. I didn't know that before long that smile would be wiped away. Instead, I got to my quarters and I made a call to the lunar base again, hoping for some answers. If anyone could explain what had happened to the Mars team, it would be them. Thankfully, I got a response. Officer Barze, I hope that everything is going alright. The chief astrophysicist asked as they came on screen. As well as can be expected, Professor. I take it you haven't heard about the incident yet, I asked. Her face told me all that I needed to know, which worried me even more. Had I stepped out of line telling her classified information? Adele, it's the middle of our cycle up here. I figured that your call was an emergency, but no one has told me anything. Except you right now. She told me. I'm not sure how much I can say. Except that one of the capsules that the Accolade 2 sent crashed near the South Atlantic this evening. I told her. Well, that sounds like good news. We haven't been able to get any readings from the drone ship for almost five days now. We were planning on reporting this tomorrow, she said. I felt a groin unease in the pit of my stomach. I hope it is something worthwhile. Dr. White, CSO Dyer, second CSO Eisenhart, and myself will begin the next phase of terrestrial experiments within the day. I told her. She nodded, seemingly struggling to stay awake. Keep me informed, she said. I will. I promised, realizing this was probably an excuse to get rest. I closed the channel and sat back, pondering over whether to go to the biome early or sit it out. I knew impatience would foster only more problems. So, I closed down all devices and I got some sleep. The last good night's rest I would ever have. November 4th. 900 hours. It would benefit anyone reading this log to understand something about our mission, as classified as it is, to understand our plight. And given what is happening now, it really doesn't bother me if I lose my job. My life always comes first. And if I am to die, I think people have the right to know. It'll likely be months before anyone reads this. I've saved everything in a cloud document to be released anonymously online. So, whatever the results, I want others to be aware of this catastrophe. I joined the team as a result of my grades under the late Professor Patrol, the man that rekindled my love for space. As a child, I always dreamed of traveling the stars, but it seemed so far off. Attending and listening to the professor's lectures at the university were like a breath of fresh air. Suddenly, with people like Elon Musk entering the scene, space travel was becoming relevant again. One day out of the blue, shortly before he ended it, my mentor asked to see me. 
I remember every detail of the conversation, for it was our very last. Adele, I have trained you so much for life beyond this world, but I fear that it is still hardly the beginning of your education, my dear. He told me with a wary sigh. I still have three years left to graduate, sir. I can learn a great deal more. I told him with a laugh. This is not a time for jokes, my dear. I'm telling you that everything you have learned is about to change. He said harshly. I stifled back a laugh and stood up straight, listening as he explained. There is a program that I enrolled you in last semester, doing great work to understand the workings of Mars. Yesterday, the chief research officer contacted me to look at your credentials. Adele, do you know what that means? I was at a loss for words. I had heard rumors of studies going on on the Red Planet, but most of that was funded by NASA. I wasn't aware of any private research, but my only question was, what are they trying to find? Hopefully, the key to our future on this planet, Petrol told me. I was given only three days to pack and told to keep my new assignment a secret from everyone, even family. And part of me was anxious, another part frightened. There was a lot going on that I didn't fully understand and it felt like my mentor had tossed me into the deep end with sharks. His sudden death shook me even harder, making me wonder if he had taken his own life as a result of something connected to this project. Some of the research that the university did wasn't exactly considered legal. And when I arrived at the underground habitation, I could tell that the work here was meant to fall into that category. The chief research officer, Baker, gave me a brief rundown of the job when I had arrived. You were chosen because of your expertise in atmospheric research. This is a vital operation for our attempt at terraforming the Red Planet. But what we do here is not something that will be heard about on the nightly news or in tabloids. Everyone here has to sign a non-disclosure agreement during their stay. And even though Professor Petrol had vouched for you several times, I'm afraid we can't make any exceptions. I understand. Good. It's easier if you fall in line with what we're doing here. The main reason the facility is so guarded is because... We don't wish to be bogged down by politics or useless regulations that could still make progress. Everyone here works together on these same projects. That being said, understand that we are largely on our own here. If things go wrong or if there is an accident, no one will be coming to our rescue. Do you believe that you can handle that risk? I told him that I could without hesitation. I didn't believe there was anything about our work that could be life-threatening. But then I saw the crash site, and seeds of doubt began to plant themselves in my brain. Anna was also worried. She had family that had died during a mishap on the lunar colony a year ago. And just being near extraterrestrial material had her on high alert. Let's get this done so we can move on, I told her, as we both donned protective suits again. The hive itself is built with three separate rings the one in the middle being the main habitat where we perform a majority of our work. To get there, you must move through a pressurized chamber. There are four of them that are a part of the middle ring relay system, and that is where Anna and I stand now. The idea is to keep all the external atmosphere and bacteria away from the main habitat, hence why we have to strip down, go through a shower and then reclothe before being allowed in. It's a monotonous process, but it also is one that you get used to over time. Inside the habitat, you could easily believe that you are actually stepping onto Mars itself. The temperature averages 50 degrees below zero on a normal day, powered by a unique system of coolant and solar energy that also keeps the lighting the exact way it would be on Mars. If it weren't for our suits, I know Anna and I would be dead, but this is just routine compared to what we are trying to uncover today. These samples from the capsule, brought back to be seen amid the rich soil that we have cultivated here for the past six months. Anna and I open the compartments and release the fresh new samples, 
mixing them with the dirt and clay on the surface of the habitat. It looks very different from the samples that we are accustomed to. It feels different as well, more like a thick liquid material. It certainly reminded me of the type of molten goop one might find from a lava flow. Initial analysis shows heavy components of volcanic material. Where did the accolade crew say this was found? Anna asked. I was staring at the glassy material, marveling at how it seemed to consume everything in its path. They haven't confirmed it just yet, but it likely came from the secondary rover near Arcea Mons. We've been attempting to enter some of the underground caverns near the Olympus for a while and proved unsuccessful. Arcea was the next candidate. That's strange. It seemed to be radiating heat a moment ago. I commented, checking my scans again. There had never been any signs of possible volcanic activity on the Red Planet for the past few centuries. Except for ancient samples from when the planet first formed, we had never encountered anything like this at all. But the readings that we were getting now seemed fresh, new. It was exciting to behold for a moment as we began to test the next sample, determining how the glassy substance interacted with the regular Martian soil. But that excitement soon shifted to nightmarish, as we returned to continue the study the following day. The first red flag was when Baker told us that they could not get a proper reading on anything within the habitat. A glitch, I asked. Eisenhart and Dyer were inside the habitat, and according to Baker, they hadn't been heard from in about an hour. This raised security level automatically to stage orange. Anna and I agreed to suit up immediately and see what was going on. November 5th, 1000 hours. Entering the habitat, it was easy to determine what was wrong. The sensors had made no lie. A tree had sprouted near to where we had been taking samples the day before. Getting closer told us what happened to our colleagues. Both Dyer and Eisenhart were now lying on the ground, covered in what looked like thin layers of spider silk. I felt my blood run cold as I wondered how it was possible for this to have happened so quickly. I'm not getting any kind of reading on the tree, Anna told me. I didn't want to even dare to get close to it. The thing was abnormal in every sense of the word. It had literally grown overnight. Send those scans to Baker, I ordered as I tried to get a hold of myself. I thought back to the circumstances surrounding the crash. A sense of foreboding had been following me ever since. This was a bad omen from the start, I thought, as Anna went to the nearby terminal, and I tried to check for vitals on our two co-workers. Much to my surprise, they were still radiating body heat. The tree, I suspected, was now keeping them alive. Just what are you? I whispered to the multicolored creation as I reached out toward it. My hand felt like it was on fire. I jerked back in pain and felt another dreadful aura begin to fall over me. This was beyond anything we had ever encountered. And then I turned to Anna and saw that she too seemed frightened. Baker has sent back new instructions, she said, her voice shaking. What is it? What do we do? I asked. She looked like she was about to cry and a moment later... My heart sunk in terror as I found out why. He says we are not to leave the facility until we can determine the cause of this abnormality. Adele, we're trapped in here. I have seen death before, but not like this. Death is a natural part of our cycle. As a scientist, I understand that some things in our environment are designed to be there as buffers. Certain species often contract others to provide a balance. The tree that is growing here in our underground facility is not like that. It comes from another world. An ancient and dead world that has not had life for perhaps a few million years. The fact that its presence here is allowing it to rejuvenate should be something that me and my colleague can celebrate. But that isn't what's happening Two of my co-workers are comatose, trapped in some kind of strange substance that exudes from the alien tree. 
and then Anna and I are prisoners. Our chief research officer, Paul Baker, and the others in charge of the hive have decided that we can't leave the facility until we determine what has caused this sudden transformation. Whatever the tree is, it's a danger, and now we are being forced to be close to it, to study it and determine if there is a way to fix what has happened. Anna, my only colleague that is still awake besides myself, is doing her best to remain calm as I struggle to document the experience. I felt that, despite the danger that we are facing, a record had to be kept. The world needed to know that this sort of evil existed. Both Subject 1 and Subject 2 appear stable. Healthy and in fact, according to my initial blood samples, she said to Baker as we gave our report at 1800 hours. The twilight cycle of the habitat was the hardest to endure, and often researchers were told to never be inside during the dropping temperatures. On the red planet, an average night can drop to well below 50 degrees zero. To mimic those conditions, our facility pumps in continuous cold oxygen to keep the environment as close to Mars as possible. But to have us inside the habitat when that happened was not heard of. Mars suits are designed to withstand the blistering cold for perhaps a few hours at best. This was going to be an all-night event. Do another test in the morning, and then see if perhaps you can move them away from the tree. Have you managed to get any reading on it yet? Baker asked. Nothing, sir. Every scan we make shows just an empty void. Despite the fact that the tree is clearly flourishing, it's not composed of any living matter. For that reason, I'm calling it the corpse tree for now, Anna said. Baker gave us instructions about a supply drop that was authorized to provide us essential supplies during the night. I was too focused on our mysterious plant to remember the details. It seemed to have grown by at least another meter just in the short span that we were here. Can you run a check of the atmospheric levels in the habitat over the past three hours? I asked Baker. What are we looking for? You know the system is still on the fritz on your end. It might be a bit jumbled, he admitted. Anything out of the ordinary. I want to see what sort of materials this corpse tree is producing, if any, I told him. He closed the channel with a promise that he would investigate. As Anna and I moved to the south side of the habitat, away from the tree and waited for the supply drop. Everything will be fine, she reassured me. I could hear a tremor in her voice. I knew she was as scared as I was, but trying very hard to hide it. I only smiled back at her and we found shelter in one of the erosive caves as we waited. The sleep would likely be impossible given the drop in temperature very soon. The cold night would wrap us and pierce our fiery souls. It was a frightening thought to think of. I decided instead to focus on our two co-workers. Do you think they'll be alright? From what I can tell, they are exhibiting the same type of response the body would have if it was entering into surgery. The tree seems to have paralyzed them, kept them asleep and alive. But I can't determine if it's harming them or not, she said. I don't need a scientific analysis right now, Anna. I want to hear what your gut has to say. I told her. She sighed, trying her hardest to not crack under the enormous pressure that we were facing. I think they may already be dead, to be honest, despite what these scans are showing us. Whatever is out there, it's not Eisenhart or Dyer. I didn't know how to respond to that, so I crept closer to her and hoped that, with our bodies together, even in the suits, we could stay warm as the temperature started to drop. Endurance through the night, and the faint hope that we could survive this, were all that we had. November 5th, 2100 hours. I kept a note of the time for when the supplies came, using the opportunity to attempt to communicate once again with the Akali too. I needed to know more about where they had uncovered this cosmic forest, to shed light on, on what we could do to combat it. But sadly, I wasn't able to get a response at this hour. Perhaps because the tree was continuing to distort the signal. Or, I considered, something unnatural had happened on the satellite station. 
It was another frightening concept to imagine. My crewmates up in space dealing with a similar situation. Had the same cosmic creation disrupted their research, taken their lives? I knew only time would give me the answers. So I resolved to stay alive long enough to find out. 2300 hours. It feels impossible to even consider rest when less than a few meters from where we hide. Dyer and Eisenhardt are suffering and being tortured by a force that we hardly understand. But somehow, Anna is able to find rest. The cave has provided some shelter from the deadly cold, and the heat within our suits as well. Every time I move, though, I feel as though the protective gear will crystallize from the weather, just beyond our tiny hiding place. And the supplies which were given, I know, are not practical. Small IV bags of a liquid diet, an additional catheter bag, and then more tools to begin dissecting the tree. Just the thought of having to eat, to survive here in this place for longer than a day, is impossible to fathom. It has made me reconsider the options that our species have to even reach Mars at all. Everything about this environment is hostile toward our species. As I struggle to rest, the next unprecedented moment happens. A pulsing light shimmers from the core of the tree. I gently nudge Dana to try and wake her up, but she was as stiff as a board. Instead, I crawled out of her cave and watched as the tree seemed to come to life with color and light. It was radiating energy, making it brighter than a star in the sky and forcing me to look away. I could see something else happening though. Eisenhart and Dyer were rising from the ground, as though being pushed up the way a tree would push roots into the heavens. I tried to call out to them, but the silky material that had covered their body was now encasing them both completely in a cocoon. Were they still trapped inside, being sapped of their energy by the tree? I pushed a little further, feeling the gravity around me get heavier, as I tried to see if I could reach Dyer. If I could reach them, maybe there was still the chance that I could save them. I thought as I struggled to put one foot in front of the other. The pulsing became louder as I stood there, trying to reach the cocoon. And then a loud noise rang out from Dyer's. Like a scream so ungodly that I was sure he was being killed over and over and over again. Surges of energy pushed through the roots of the tree, shooting up into his body as I saw the silk begin to fade away. It was heating up and burning away his tomb. I realized as I saw his pained face. His mouth and eyes covered in roots as he struggled to move. The energy continuously shooting more raging power into his body. Finally, this insanity came to an end, to a maddening crescendo as his whole body seemed to shimmer and shake, and then Dyer exploded all around me, his intestines and organs flailing out like a bomb went off, as his blood and other bodily fluids covered my protective gear. It hit the suit like acid, burning away at the gear as I felt the deadly cold touch my skin. My body did not have time to react as I felt shock hit my arm, a small part of my lower wrist crystallizing from the intense temperature. I stumbled backward, hardly able to compose myself, as I flailed my arms and screamed to Anna for help. Somehow, my cries woke her from her intense sleep. She ran toward me, pulling me to the enclosure, rapidly getting the supplies needed to protect my suit before more damage was done. But was it already too late? I could feel my heart beating rapidly as I looked toward the debris of Dyer's body. The tree had used him to its full extent and then discarded him as refuse. I am quite sure the longer that we stay here, it will do the same to us. Less than 10 hours have passed since Anna and I have been forced to be trapped inside the same habitat that we have worked in for two years. Before this day, I thought that I understood how the universe works. Perhaps that was haughty of me as a scientist, but I have always thought there is a natural order to everything that happens on our world. Our work to change the surface of Mars wasn't supposed to be different, but now I stare in the face of something that I can't comprehend. It resembles a tree, but that is a truthfully poor description. 
Since I've had time to recover and rest, I would do my best to explain what it is in this current log. I have no idea if we're going to get out of here, or if we're even going to make it to tomorrow given how powerful and strange this new entity we discovered is. Which is why I must document everything as quickly and reasonably as possible, if I can. I suspect the mysterious tree also is having an effect on our mental health. Given how both Anna and I have been reacting over the past hour, each moment that we are trapped here, it gains strength. From the air, from the ground, everything around it, pulling off its energy, both seen and unseen, it wants to consume it all. But I need to understand why this is happening, to make sense of all this. So, I will continue to log and hope that these science I have trusted for so long won't fail me now. November 6th, 500 hours. We have lost communication with Baker and anyone beyond the habitat. I believe this means that the tree has extended its roots to control that part of the environment. The temperature is changing slowly as well. I had thought the tree might be adjusting everything to suit it better, but it is difficult to be certain. The pulses of energy I observed from the night before have not returned, for example. But I know that this strange life form is observing us the same way that we are doing it. I feel as though after what happened with Dyer, it has gone into stasis for a while. It is full from whatever it did to cause his body to explode. It still causes me to shudder to think of how quickly one of my colleagues died. But I know that more death will follow if Anna and I cannot understand this powerful force. Our first task is to take samples of what is left of Dyer's body, scattered across the habitat like rain. Baker theorized that perhaps remnants of the tree might still be within his bodily fluids, and since we couldn't get close enough to research it firsthand, this would be the next best thing. I can't properly describe how awful and gut-wrenching it felt to use the same equipment for collecting his remains, as I had less than a week ago for normal research. It was terrifying to imagine the next thing that might be scraped off the surface of the ground was our own body. How are you holding up? I asked Anna after we had collected a good portion of the remains into a container. I didn't look at it, I couldn't. He was a friend and colleague turned into nothing but a puddle of goo. Frightening, couldn't even begin to describe it. And I was somewhat relieved to hear Anna echo my concerns as she said, I wonder how much pain he experienced there near the end. It must have been the worst thing in his entire life. Anna began the initial test, taking samples and placing them into tubes. Our resources were only going to last a short period of time under these conditions, and Baker made it crystal clear. He wasn't about to shut down the project simply because our lives were in danger. Of course, I was angry about it, but another part of me understood. This was life-changing, species-changing. We needed to know what we were up against. Anna and I might not make it out of there. It was terrifying to consider that all our efforts were only going to be a blip in the research papers. But for those beyond these walls, it didn't matter. We were beyond help as far as they were concerned. An audible gasp from Anna brought my thoughts back to the test. She was showing me the readings, but even when I saw them, I still felt compelled to ask. Are you sure that's right? Maybe the equipment is malfunctioning, I said. The doctor shook her head and replied. I double-checked. This is accurate. Somehow, there are still signs of life amid this goob. Parts of Dyer that are still functioning. His cells are replicating within this thing. I don't understand it. I forced myself to look down at the primordial mess. It seemed to be swirling, moving about the way a fish might under mud. Could it be that our friend and colleague was still alive, despite his body being gone? We checked the surrounding area where his bodily debris had fallen next, discovering more heat signatures and new growth. There were saplings sprouting from the ground, but these were not like the first tree at all. 
No, uh, these strange branching plants were made of skin and bone, muscle and tissue. Anna made a dark hypothesis as we observed the horror before us. It used Dyer as a means to pollinate, transforming his body from his normal molecular structure into something that could spread and evolve. It's reproducing, she realized. November 6th, 1300 hours. We have been advised by Baker to keep our distance from the new growth. There are approximately 13 seeds in all, each seemingly growing from a different organ of dyers that spread across the habitat. I have been focusing on Eisenhardt's cocoon, which has shown no signs of movement. It has occurred to me that if the tree is currently resting, I might have a chance to free him from his silk prison. As Anna focuses herself on these strange deadly plants, I begin to cut apart the thick material encasing Eisenhardt. At first, I believe that I'm going to be succeeding, but then I detect a reaction from the central tree. Strange snake-like roots swivel toward me, covering my colleague back up again every time that I cut. The tree is defending itself. I can only think of one solution to prevent Eisenhardt from becoming a host to another pollination attempt by this monster. Heading over to the terminal, I put in a supply request. This seems unorthodox, Adele. What are you planning? And Baker asked. And please understand that Eisenhardt is dead. He had died days ago. But we need to prevent this thing from spreading, Paul. It isn't safe. Can't you see by merely monitoring it that we are risking everyone's life? I asked. Our system has never detected any threat to Eisenhardt's body. Anna confirmed that. He is healthy and in no pain. You are suggesting killing him. If we don't, he will just be consumed like Dyer was, I argued. How can we be so sure that Dyer is truly gone? Baker asked. I realized that I was talking in circles to him. Busyness would always come before people's lives. You know, you really should have been a politician. I told him bitterly as I closed the channel. You can't blame him for how he feels. I turned to argue with my former lover and instead found a scream emerging from my lips. Anna had changed. Gross had covered her suit like barnacles, resembling a strange ring-like fungus mixed with vines. Anna, what happened? I said as I tried to reach out to her. She took a step back, her eyes glassy and with a far-off look. It was inevitable that this outcome would occur. Your species is notorious for stretching the limits of its knowledge beyond what they should allow, Anna told me, but her voice didn't sound like her own. It gave me a cold chill down my spine as I realized that the creature was channeling its thoughts into my friend. She was becoming a puppet too. What are you? I asked. Everything. Existence from within and without. We are death come to this world from beyond. The eternal and we have you to thank for that, it responded. We only want to understand. Humans want to coexist with all species, I told it. You lie to yourself when you say that. Consuming Dyer allowed us to understand emotion. He was not thinking of empathy, but only his anger, fear and rage dominating him. He wanted to destroy us. And you also, Dr. Borze. You have only shown us fear and hostility. Our ways are only to benefit. We consume to prevent destruction. How can you not understand? Anna reached up with her left hand, and I saw that she was preparing to undo her helmet. Don't, you'll kill her, I screamed. Have we not proven that death is meaningless to us? We have evolved beyond it. There is no life or death where we exist. Only us. We are existence. It'll be the same with you. We are offering a new start for your species. The controlling tree pulled her helmet off and I screamed again as the deadly atmosphere hit my friend. Anna's body began to crystallize in mere seconds, cascading like glass down into her suit as I tried to rush and save her. Instead, I found myself falling into a massive slosh of goop. Her entire body and suit was now mounting inward, cascading on top of me, 
as more of these strange writhing tentacles attacked me. I screamed at the top of my lungs and crawled away, hearing a strong whoosh from above. A miracle. Baker had chosen to allow oxygen to enter the habitat. The creature was stunned momentarily as I had escaped. Rushing to the nearest enclosure as its strange substance fell from my own suit. And then I looked toward the garden of corpses and saw all three of my colleagues now were completely transformed into over three dozen small branching trees, all preparing to spread toward me. November 7th, 630 hours. All communications have failed us. What little messages we could get out to the facility are now cut off thanks to the tree. I'm sorry. I say we as if I'm not alone here. I know Anna is gone now, a part of this cosmic horror, but I will still struggle to come to terms with it. I know I will die here soon, but I won't go without a fight. I have decided to use the last portion of my supplies to construct a small thermal bomb to destroy the tree and its saplings. The oxygen, which flooded the facility less than 10 hours ago, I know this was a delaying tactic by Baker and the others in charge. The only reason that I'm alive is to finish the research, but I can't be the test subject anymore. I don't want to wind up like Eisenhart, Dyer, or Anna. Within two hours, I finish the first thermal bomb and decide that it's time to test. I move from my enclosure toward the strange and cosmic garden. The corpses haven't moved much since our last encounter when the strange growth failed to swallow me whole. But I know that they don't want to make the same mistake again. Eisenhardt's cocoon is the closest. His body is the only one untouched by the alien force so far. I use these simple tools that I have to pierce the side of the silky flesh that encases him and place the detonating device next to his body as the tree's roots scramble to cover it up. You seek to kill us. A strange and almost ethereal voice calls out from the ground. I froze as I looked at the sprouts, each one of them grown from the remnants of my friends. Bone and flesh had mixed together to form organs like mouths, ears, and eyes. The tree was evolving and transforming its saplings into plant people. I thought as I looked down at one of the hypnotic eyes. Why do you refuse to join our evolution, Adele? It was now using Dyer's voice as I stepped away, the detonator in my hand. You talk as though you are advancing our species, but it's a lie. All I have seen over these past few days is death and destruction. You have taken the soul of my colleagues and turned them into your mindless drones. I screamed as I pressed the button. Behind me, I heard the silky material begin to whine and blow up like a balloon as the roots struggled to control the explosion of fire that I had caused. Finally, it split up beyond Eisenhardt's body, and the goop that I had seen Anna transform into came sloshing out, ready to attack me. Instinct kicked in as I ran from the husk, moving to a higher elevation as I grabbed the other few tools that I had left to attempt to fight back. This was just the beginning of my assault on the cosmic being, but it was clearly changing its view of me as just a nuisance. Thanks to destroying these seedlings within Eisenhardt's body, I was now considered a threat. We have told you already that death is beyond what we are capable of. You seek to destroy that which exists outside your own understanding. This is not how your colleagues would have wanted it. Is it not human nature to grow, to learn, to advance yourself? We are the epitome of knowledge. Of all, the mouths that were growing them in the garden all spoke at once. Cascading chaos was spilling out of them as they grew together toward my location, and I ran to the main generator. I needed them close enough to be sure that what I did made an impact. You can use our language to spit out all that pithy filth all day for all I care. It's just a bunch of lies. You're a virus, an invader. And if there is one thing you might not understand about our species yet... It's that we are fighters, I screamed. I used a wrench and I started to bang at the control panel, the life force of the entire habitat. If I was successful, I knew this might cause more problems for me than solutions. 
but I wasn't here to try and save myself anymore. This was beyond that. The strange writhing monster that was now using the entire earth beneath its roots to move toward me. Stretching its tentacles out as Anna, I and Artin Dyer's skull-like faces screamed toward me. It was to be destroyed, whether I lived or not. The mistake, I realized at long last, was trying to revive it from its slumber. Maybe it was immortal, but then again, it's been dead before. I wonder if maybe centuries ago, some other species found it on Mars and they destroyed it. Or maybe the desolation on the red planet is a direct result of this monster. Everything in the habitat reeks of death now, because of it consuming everything. It's an inevitable outcome for such a virus. Its only purpose seems to be spreading and consuming more, making everything turn into an aberration of itself. It's nearly on top of me now. This is my final log. I am screaming in defiance of my colleagues, against the research I was instructed to do, and against what some might consider a god. I must fight this fate, kill the unkillable. The creature is here. I have no choice but to go now. I pray this log is my last. I pray I'm not also a part of this monster soon. Goodbye. November 10th, 1400 hours. Log of Adele Borze uploaded to cloud server. Commentary below of the situation extrapolated on by Chief Research Officer Paul Baker. Seeing Adele take her own life was a nightmarish to behold. Our services were unable to stop the destruction of the hive, of the alien forcer of Dr. Borze. Her efforts to cause the entire facility to collapse were indeed successful. All of our years of research and funding were lost in an instance. When I discovered these logs and read all the things that Adele and the others had experienced, I debated what to do with it for quite some time. And then today, the choice was taken from me. Dr. Taggart arrived at 100 hours this morning to retrieve what was left of the Mars habitat. She has explained to me that this is imperative our research on the newly discovered cosmic being continue elsewhere. So, then this will be something that the Janus Project will spearhead for the foreseeable future, I asked her. I make a mental note that I must research the group further, for their clandestine tactics have always troubled me. I will run it by the commander, but as far as I am concerned, we have no other choice. You recall the incident on the moon as well as the other phenomenon that we have encountered lately. Our time is running out, and the confirmation from the Accolade 2 confirms that the being is not from Mars at all. It seems our fears of shadows from the true world entering this dimension were justified, Paul, she told me. I could hear the fear in her voice, which has made me almost equally frightened. I chose to hide Adele's logs from her, and I will instead send all of them to the cloud. If Dr. Borze was able to properly make use of these service, they will be released into the network four months from now. I have no idea what will occur after that, but I suspect we will still be at war with these things. Maybe by then, new hope will sprout. It's all we have left. I hope you all enjoyed today's episode. And I want to give a big thanks to today's sponsors, BetterHelp. Creepscast listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash mrcreeps. And Audible. Get started with your 30-day free trial by visiting audible.com slash creepscast or text creepscast to 500-500. Please support today's sponsors if you can, as they help keep this content free for all listeners. And, as always, stay creepy.